of my own boss. But I, I liked it, the friendship and the comradeship and, and the work we did. It was heavy and hard work, but I liked it about it. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to The Green Tunnel, a podcast about the history of the Appalachian Trail. My name is Mills Kelly, and I'm your host. Today, we're going back to the earliest days of the Appalachian Trail to learn more about the critical role that the Civilian Conservation Corps played in making the trail a reality. That clip you just heard was Miles Fenton, who was one of the millions of American men who were enrolled in the CCC between 1933 and 1942. Fenton worked on a CCC crew in Maine and helped build the Appalachian Trail there. When Fenton's CCC crew finished the last mile of the trail in Maine in 1937, the entire trail was complete from the summit of Mount Katahdin in Maine to the summit of Mount Oglethorpe in Georgia. The interview you just heard took place in 2012 on the 75th anniversary of the trail's completion. The building of the Appalachian Trail largely coincided with the greatest economic crisis the United States has ever faced, the Great Depression. The CCC was one of the foundational programs in Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal, and the program gave work to three million unemployed young men between 1933 and the American entry into World War II. And the CCC was the first New Deal program that involved the government directly providing jobs to unemployed persons as a means of relief. That's Ben Alexander, a historian and the author of The New Deal's Forest Army. It was also the only such program that was live-in. The enrollees, that's what they were called, lived in camps of 200 that were run by the army. The way it worked, the young men who joined the CCC had to be members of families that were on the relief rolls, and they had to be unemployed and out of school. Out of school could mean they had graduated, but in a lot of instances, probably most, it meant that they had dropped out. And by the way, while the minimum age was 18, 17 in some of the years, a substantial number of younger teenagers who had dropped out of school got into the CCC by lying about their age. But not all of the CCC enrollees were young. There were also CCC companies made up of veterans from World War I and prior military engagements. Enrollees in the Corps lived in camps set up by the Army, and they spent their days working outdoors on projects that ranged from planting trees to building fire towers, to helping to create roads, trails, and structures in America's national parks. Fortunately for Appalachian trail hikers, a fair amount of that work took place along the AT. CCC enrollees helped to build and sometimes relocate long sections of the trail in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park, Shenandoah National Park, and especially in Maine. In addition, they built lots of structures along the trail including many shelters that hikers still use today. For example, if you hike to the summit of Blood Mountain in Georgia, you'll find yourself at a stone shelter built by a local CCC crew. That shelter is a testament to the CCC's love of cement. In addition to using cement to bind the stones used to make the walls and the chimney, the floor of the shelter is poured concrete. And in one of the more amusing quirks of the CCC's work along the trail, someone in that Georgia crew dropped his claw hammer into the curing cement on the floor of the shelter. He retrieved it, but didn't smooth the cement back over. A ghostly impression has remained ever since to remind us of that moment. Just north of Blood Mountain at Neal's Gap, hikers come to the Wallace Yi Interpretive Center. It's a large stone building that now houses the popular Mountain Crossings Outfitters. Built by the CCC between 1934 and 1937, this beautiful old building served as a dining hall for decades. It's also only about 40 miles from the trail's southern terminus and is often where northbounders, who find through hiking too difficult, bail out and go home. 
Being a CCC enrollee wasn't all fun and cement, though. As Ben says, life in the CCC camps was very regimented. The camps were run by the Army. Every camp had a captain and several other officers in charge. But the enrollees weren't given military training. Some elements of camp life did resemble the military. The dining hall was called the mess hall, and their bunk beds were inspected every morning for neatness. But during the day, the enrollees, for the most part, did work under civilian bosses, either in the forestry or the parks department. At night, they were back in the camps run by the army. And it was hard work, dangerous too, because CCC enrollees were called upon to fight forest fires sometimes losing their own lives. So by any standards, the government demanded a lot from CCC enrollees. In addition to lots of hard work outdoors, the enrollees received a number of important benefits. The enrollees were paid $30 a month, of which 23 had to be allotted to their families back home, leaving them $7 a month for pocket money. On weekend nights, the boys went into town. Back then, seven dollars a month was real money. They went into town on their nights off, went to dances, met young women. A number of enrollees met their lifelong soulmates at the local dances. They would wake up early in the morning. They would have their beds inspected by the army officers. And then they'd get into trucks and go work for civilian bosses for the day, doing whatever they were doing. And they'd come back at night, have dinner in the mess hall. And by the way, the meals served in the CCC made a big difference. And it wasn't just the enrollees who were well fed. Sometimes, AT hikers got to sample the wonders of the CCC kitchens. Not long ago, I found an account of a hike from Harper's Ferry to Skyland Lodge in Shenandoah National Park in the archives of the Potomac Appalachian Trail Club. It was the story of two young men from Baltimore who decided to spend a week on the AT in 1937. Their hike didn't start off well because they got caught in one torrential downpour after another. After a week on the trail, they showed up bedraggled at a CCC camp in the north end of the park where they were given a hot shower, a hot dinner, bunks to sleep in, and then a hot breakfast. Here's how Ben Beck described their experiences. Before going to bed, the construction boss took us to the dining hall to eat. He rested two cooks who opened up the dining hall and dragged out a colossal meal. It was a daisy. For us two bums, they served stuffed peppers, two ham sandwiches, with real ham and lots of it, biscuits, tomatoes, coffee, bread, butter, elegant blackberry jelly, Herb ate it with a spoon on the sly, and two large bowls of sliced pineapple. Fit for a king, don't you think? The following morning, we went down to the cookhouse and had a breakfast of oatmeal, hot biscuits, and bacon and eggs. Finishing that repast, we were told we owed them nothing. So we packed up and were on the trail by eight. Last night was an example of real hospitality. Their kindness was well evident and certainly appreciated by Herb and me. All that food mattered even more to the enrollees. Here's Miles Fenton again. Meals are good, but Sunday was always... Sliced meats at night, and there was salami and something else, and liverwurst. In the noontime, we'd on the trot. The meal would be liverwurst and you know, sliced meats. Got so after a while, I liked it. I got so I could eat it. Given that it was the Great Depression, being able to eat so well made the heavy work expected of the crews a lot easier to do. A lot of enrollees who had been undernourished when they entered, gained weight. Now, they had to meet certain weight requirements and health requirements to get in in the first place, but still, a lot of them had their health drastically improved by getting quality meals while in the CCC. The CCC administration also wanted to make sure that enrollees left their experiences on a crew better able to function in the modern economy. At night, they were likely to be attending classes because from the start, it became clear that one of the biggest needs of the enrollees was education. 
The first year, classes were improvised and makeshift, but by the second year, there was a formal education program with every camp having an education advisor. The classes ranged from basic literacy and math to more advanced subjects, including higher math, vocational skills like auto mechanics and electronics, and history and current affairs. ATC Chairman Myron Avery was very enthusiastic about enlisting the CCC's labor pool for the Appalachian Trail. But there was a big fundamental problem standing in the way of using CCC workers to complete the trail. The enabling legislation that established the organization said that young men enrolled in CCC crews were supposed to work on federal or state lands, not private property. And the vast majority of the AT was on private land. What to do? Especially in Maine, where the most work remained to be done, and the mountains were the wildest. Maine was very different. There were limitations in the legislation on work on private land. My name is Dave Field. I'm a professional forester who spent most of his career as a college professor, running forestry programs in various places. I've worked on the Appalachian Trail every year since 1956, 55 actually, and been a member of the Maine Appalachian Trail Club since then, and an officer of the Maine Appalachian Trail Club since 1967. Served on the Appalachian Trail Conference Board of Managers for 26 some odd years, chairman of the board for six years, and have just been very involved with the trail primarily in Maine. And about 90, 95% of the Appalachian Trail in Maine was on private forest land. And there were 28 active CCC camps in Maine. There were only 12 of those that were authorized to work on private forest land where just about all of the AT in Maine was located. Just in case you didn't catch that, Dave has been a volunteer with the Maine Appalachian Trail Club for just shy of 70 years. And he maintained the trail on Saddleback Mountain for 60 years. I think it's safe to say that no one knows more about the AT in Maine than Dave. According to Dave, the ATC leadership, principally ATC Chairman Myron Avery, found creative ways to work around the limitations placed on CCC labor. There was this clause that referred to work in the public interest. That was the key claim. And so the argument was made, well, gee, the Appalachian Trail is this national treasure, and that's certainly in the public interest. But what Myron Avery, who was, of course, centrally involved with the trail in Maine, really leveraged as much as he could was the fact that most of the authorization for work on private land in Maine by the CCC was for fire protection, forest fire protection. And that included building roads and trails to improve access for forest firefighters and equipment. There was a forest fire over in Andover North Surplus back in the 1930s. The firefighters used the very rough Appalachian Trail at the time to get to the fire, and Avery would just say, see, see, <laughs> told you so. So he leveraged that, among other things. The operation of the CCC in Maine was put entirely under the Maine Forest Service. Working in coordination with the U.S. Forest Service, Forest Service had kind of final say in it, but it was really the Maine Forest Service. As Dave explains, most of the AT in Maine ran through what is known as the unorganized territories, meaning millions of acres of rural land that is managed directly by the state without any sort of local governing authority, like a county or a town. And a large number of the CCC camps in Maine were located in the unorganized territory. It was enrollees from those camps who did the vast majority of the work building the AT in Maine between 1935 and 1937. The final two miles were cut on August 14, 1937, between Spalding Mountain and Sugarloaf, a high saddle between Spalding and Sugarloaf. And one of the most magical experiences I've had is on August 14, 1987, we had a really great gathering near Sugarloaf. 
and we had actually seven CCC veterans there, including a man named Miles Fenton, who was on the crew August 14, 1937. We cheated a little and rode the gondola up to the top of Sugarloaf, but then we hiked over to a big boulder, and Miles went with us and installed a plaque commemorating that event. Those seven surviving CCC enrollees told some stories. They were really thrilled. They volunteered for Appalachian Trail work. One person talked about being in the CCC like being at an elegant dinner and the Appalachian Trail was dessert. They really liked getting out and contributing to what they saw as a, as a really good project. I've spent a fair amount of time in the forest of New England and upstate New York. And as beautiful as they are, they are also afflicted with an insect that is proof, at least to me, of the existence of Satan, the black fly. If you've ever been bitten by a black fly, you know what I mean. I asked Dave how those CCC enrollees dealt with those awful insects. <laughs> you can't. You can't. I mean, look, my first job in the woods in Maine was up in actually Township 10, Range 17, in the summer of 1959. I was using, oh, it was a really awful fly dope that consisted of tar and citronella and you name it, and I left half a bottle somewhere up in the woods there and never went back. I haven't used fly dope for uh, 40 years. Well, you know, DEET, which is the main ingredient in most things, came out of World War II research. Really, tar and citronella were the kind of the standard ingredients of most of the stuff that was being used then. And, and smoky fires, I mean, you couldn't do much. So they just toughed it out and got eaten alive while making a trail for us to enjoy. Speaking as someone who seems especially tasty to biting insects like the black fly, I'm not sure I could have done what Dave has done all these decades. As the year comes to a close, we are so grateful to all of you who have supported our show by listening, by reviewing us on your favorite podcast app, and by boosting us on social media. On behalf of our team, I'd like to ask you to please consider making a donation to support the work we're doing. A gift of any amount will help us keep making the world's best podcast on the Appalachian Trail. So please go to our website, r2studios.org, and click on Support Us. Thanks. For AT hikers who venture onto the trail south of the Potomac River, the work of the CCC is almost impossible to avoid. In Shenandoah National Park, the AT cuts back and forth across Skyline Drive, the scenic road that runs through the park from north to south. Although CCC crews didn't build the road itself, that work was done by the Bureau of Public Roads, CCC crews did build most of the overlooks along the drive. In addition, they built Big Meadows Lodge near the center of the park in 1939. Most importantly for hikers, though, CCC crews relocated large sections of the AT that had been obliterated by the construction of the scenic road. And working with volunteers from the Potomac Appalachian Trail Club, they built many of the stone and beam shelters, called huts in the park, that are so characteristic of the trail in Shenandoah. South of the park, CCC crews also helped with the early stages of construction of the 460-mile-long Blue Ridge Parkway. As in Shenandoah, the enrollees built overlooks, waysides, and other structures along the parkway, locations frequented by AT hikers. The parkway also forced the trail to move off the ridgetop in many locations, and CCC crews helped with the relocation of the trail, often just down the slope from the road. The AT south of Roanoke moved away from the Blue Ridge Parkway in 1952, but before it did, a CCC crew in Floyd County built one lonely stone shelter overlooking Virginia's Piedmont and what is now the Rocky Knob Recreation Area. Earl Schaefer, the first through hiker, spent a cold and windy night in that shelter. That unnamed shelter holds a special place in my heart because it is one of the few tangible remnants of the original route of the AT in Virginia. 
and the views from its front porch are pretty spectacular. In the Smokies, CCC crews built miles of trail and some of the more difficult to get to stretches of the new park. In the Pisgah, Cherokee, and Nantahala National Forests, CCC crews built and maintained hundreds of miles of the AT. And in Maine, in addition to a substantial portion of the trail, Enrollees built many trailside shelters, all in the western part of the state. The Maine woods were much more difficult places to work, and not just because of the black flies. Instead of building stone and cement structures, CCC crews built those shelters out of logs and fresh cut shingles that they shaped right on site. The CCC shelters were all roofed with hand hewn shingles, and they began to leak about two years after they were installed, and I slept in a lot of those and got really wet. All but one of those main CCC shelters are gone now. There is only one that I'm certain is still standing. The CCC built two lean-tos at Horns Pond on the Bigelow Mountain Range. There are new ones there now, but one of the old ones was kept, and it's kind of run down. There's discussion about whether to keep it, and there is the Antiquities Act that comes to play here, and some of the CCC shelters that we dismantled required a lot of paperwork to get permission. This one at Horns Pond, of course, is on state land, not national park land, so it's a little different, but the state is still bound by some of the Antiquities Act. I'm particularly uh, protective of this one because it's the first one I ever slept in, 1955. And I spent a memorable night there, March 28, 1958, where a guy with me and I got to the site and there was nothing but a flat snowfield with a little treetop sticking up out of it. And we finally picked a spot and started digging. And two feet down, we hit the ridge pole of that lean-to and then had to dig it out to get into it. It was uh, 15 feet of snow. AT hikers who are used to nice, flat, plywood or plank floors in the trail shelters, would have found those old shelters just a wee bit uncomfortable for sleeping in. All the CCC lean-tos in Maine, none of them had boards for floors. They were all small peeled poles. Took 40 or 50 very tiny little spruce and fir poles to build up a floor. And, And of course, they were awful to sleep on. Except that people don't understand that the first thing you did in those years when you got to a lean-to was cut a bunch of fir boughs and weave them into those poles and build up a beautiful, springy, fragrant mattress of fur boughs. And the next time you got there, you tore out the old ones and put in new ones, which, of course, would have denuded the forest for miles around if the practice had continued. But this was before sleeping pads were invented. One of those shelters was the Myron H. Avery Memorial Shelter in Bigelow Call, built in honor of the legendary ATC chairman. Avery was a son of Maine, and certainly would have loved knowing that a shelter in the Bigelows was named for him. It's not there anymore, though. The citizen referendum in 1976 directed the state to buy the land that created the Bigelow Preserve and protected the Bigelow Mountain Range. The feeling was that the Bigelow Call was just too fragile an environmental area to have an attraction like the lean-to to draw people there. And by that time, The fire tower in the mountain had been abandoned. The warden's cabin in the call was abandoned. The Maine Appalachian Trail Club set up a volunteer program using the call for caretakers and overseeing what became a developed camping area with prepared platforms, but no shelter. And it's called the Avery Memorial Campsite now. All those roadside turnouts, stone lodges, and trail shelters are tangible reminders of the critical role the CCC played in helping to complete the AT. What's less obvious is what enrollees did to reshape the mountain landscape and ecosystems the trail passes through. Many of the mountains the AT crosses were open farmland in the 1930s when the trail was being built. And CCC crews helped reforest many of those mountains. According to Ben Alexander, CCC enrollees ultimately planted more than 3 billion trees across the United States. 
it would be great if the story of the CCC's involvement with the Appalachian Trail was just one big happy story. But history is rarely like that. For all the great work CCC crews did for our country, the Civilian Conservation Corps administration also perpetuated one of the worst aspects of American society at the time, racial segregation. That has to be seen in the context of the bigger picture. There was still a Supreme Court decision on the books from 1896, Plessy v. Ferguson, that said that segregation was perfectly all right with the Constitution, with the fiction of separate but equal. It also needs to be understood that, especially in the South, the need for segregation was an article of faith among whites. We're not just talking prejudice, we're talking sense of identity rooted in racial superiority and rooted in the need for a very ritualistic caste system. So, especially in the South, the white public would not have gone along with racially integrated CCC camps. So, there were white camps and so-called colored camps. Not surprisingly, CCC administrators, who were almost entirely white men, consistently favored the interest of white enrollees over black enrollees. When white and black enrollees were in the same company, and when white enrollees engaged in racist attacks against the blacks, from what I've been able to find on record, Authorities generally tended to treat it as a black problem rather than a racism problem. It should also be noted that everywhere, north and south, local white communities screamed bloody murder at the thought of a camp of 200 young black men being located anywhere near where they lived, a fear that was not supported by any reality. But even with all the indignities that they suffered, and there were many, Black enrollees benefited from being in the CCC. African Americans were overrepresented in the ranks of those who needed relief from unemployment and poverty, and the CCC provided that relief. Black enrollees had a higher rate of choosing to re enroll for a second term. President Roosevelt micromanaged much of the CCC's work and was very aware of these problems but he tended to let others in his administration take any heat coming from black leaders or the black press over the ways that black enrollees were dealt with by their officers. FDR walked a tightrope on the subject. On the one hand, he was careful not to offend Southern white sensibilities because he needed the support of the white Southern Democrats in Congress for all of his New Deal measures, and they were making a rare exception as it was, tolerating any expansion of the functions of the federal government on account of the dire conditions of the Depression, and FDR knew this well. The Southern Democrats would ordinarily consider their racial protocols to be threatened by any expansion of federal power, whether it was about race or not. So FDR was careful to tread lightly when it came to Southern white sensibilities. At the same time, he successfully won over a lot of the black population with carefully measured gestures that he made sure were heavily publicized in the black press. Black enrollees in the camps in the South were often restricted from visiting local towns, many of which were predominantly or even entirely white, and all of which were segregated. While relations between the camps and local towns were often good, or at least tolerable. In at least one instance near the trail in southern Virginia, tensions between townspeople and black men coming to the town for a day off exploded into a full-on melee. Leaders of the Appalachian Trail Clubs, some of which were segregated themselves, did their best to ignore the issue of race altogether when it came to obtaining help on the trail. I could find no evidence in the archives of the various trail clubs or the ATC where leaders mentioned the racial composition of a given CCC crew. My take is that the clubs in the ATC were so pleased to have help on the trail that they were willing to set aside whatever racial views they might have had to make sure that they got help from the CCC. Despite these problems, the CCC provided relief to 3 million men at a time when unemployment in the United States was at an all-time high. Being a part of the CCC 
didn't just help those young men and their families financially. It also offered them access to education and job training, all while being well-fed at a time when so many Americans were struggling to find their next meal. Across the United States, there are hundreds of national, state, and local parks and forests that began or expanded dramatically with the help of CCC enrollees. Along the AT, we get to stay in shelters, eat in lodges, and spend time in picnic areas built more than 80 years ago by those strong young men, strung out along the 2,000 plus miles of the trail we love. The Green Tunnel is a production of R2 Studios at the Roy Rosenzweig Center for History and New Media at George Mason University. Today's episode was produced by me. Jeanette Patrick and Jim Ambusky are the executive producers. We want to offer a special thanks to Ben Alexander and Dave Field for sharing their insights into the history of the CCC and its connection to the Appalachian Trail. And to Dan Howlett for voicing Ben Beck. Original music for our show is performed by Scott Miller of Swoop, Virginia, and Andrew Small and Ashley Watkins of Floyd, Virginia. We're able to bring you this show through the generosity of the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation and many individual donors like you. To help us continue to produce the world's best podcast on the Appalachian Trail, please visit our website at r2studios.org and click on the Support Us link to make a donation of any amount. We really appreciate it. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you soon. Thank you.